Amid the excitement surrounding the Starship Flight 4 launch schedule over the past few days, another issue has garnered significant attention. The cause of the explosion of both the Super Heavy and Starship during the third Starship launch has just been updated in the latest SpaceX announcement. So, what went wrong with the vehicle in the third Starship launch? How did SpaceX solve this problem? And what does SpaceX use those solutions? Let's find out in today's episode of AlphaTech. On May 24th, alongside announcing the official launch date for the fourth Starship flight, SpaceX released a detailed update on the third flight. The update seems very timely to answer all the mysteries we've been wondering about for the past two months. During the third flight of Starship, when the second stage of the rocket reached space, the vehicle was subsequently lost during its return journey. The vehicle began to lose altitude control during its movement in space. This loss of attitude control resulted in a non-nominal re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. SpaceX was able to maintain communication with the vehicle up to an altitude of 65 kilometers before telemetry was lost due to excessive heat. The most likely root cause of the unplanned roll was determined to be the clogging of the valves responsible for roll control. In response, SpaceX has added additional roll control thrusters on upcoming Starships to improve attitude control redundancy and upgraded the hardware for better resilience to blockage. This appears to be part of the reason why SpaceX did not attempt to restart the Raptor engines during the upper stage flight of Starship, indicating that these new roll control thrusters had not yet been implemented. Also, during the third flight, SpaceX attempted a soft landing of the Super Heavy booster, but was unsuccessful. After separating from the Starship's upper stage as planned, 13 out of the 33 Raptor engines on Super Heavy successfully reignited to execute a controlled flight through the lower atmosphere. However, during this boostback burn, six of these engines shut down early. During the landing phase, as the rocket approached the sea, it was supposed to use the same 13 engines for the final landing burn. The six engines that shut down early in the boost back burn were disabled from attempting the landing burn startup, leaving seven engines commanded to start with two successfully reaching main stage ignition, the company said in its recap of the flight. The booster had lower than expected landing burn thrust when contact was lost at approximately 462 meters in altitude over the Gulf of Mexico and just under seven minutes into the mission. SpaceX explained that the root cause was filter clogging in the liquid oxygen supply to the engines, leading to a loss of input pressure in the engine's oxygen pump turbines. SpaceX made hardware changes before Flight 3 to mitigate this issue, which allowed the booster to attempt its first landing burn. For Flight 4 and beyond, the Super Heavy booster will have additional hardware inside the oxygen tank to further improve propellant filtering. Using the data collected from Super Heavy's first landing burn attempt, additional hardware and software changes are being implemented to increase the reliability of the Raptor engine startup during landing conditions. To understand more easily, SpaceX is using rocket propellants, fuel and oxidizer, that freeze at different temperatures. The tanks and pipes carrying these propellants are in contact with each other. As the propellants flow through the system during the flight, the changing temperatures and pressures can cause some of the propellants to partially freeze and form slush or ice flakes. These ice particles could then clog the filters in the system. SpaceX is working to redesign parts of the system and adjust operations to prevent this ice buildup issue. Surprisingly, the problem seems to be occurring more with the oxygen propellant rather than the methane fuel. For now, SpaceX appears to be focusing on making the rocket systems more tolerant to debris as a short-term solution, while they continue working on a permanent fix for the ice buildup problem. However, SpaceX's hardware refinements might cause the dry mass of the Super Heavy booster to increase continuously, which is a disadvantage for the booster's landing. Another possible reason could be that the fuel tank used for the booster's landing was originally designed for a lighter booster weight before they decided to keep the inner stage attached during the landing. Indeed, don't forget that the hot stage was only added after the first flight. Before that, SpaceX hadn't designed any intermediate components between the two rocket stages. So, how did SpaceX address this issue? Well, although this is my personal speculation, the explanation seems quite logical. SpaceX did something they hadn't done in the previous three flights, sacrificing the hot stage ring after it had completed the mission. This is also mentioned in their updated timeline for the fourth flight. At T plus 354, SpaceX will perform the process of getting rid of, or as they call it, jettisoning the ring. By doing this, SpaceX can reduce the booster's weight to better match the vehicle's tolerance. This helps ensure the booster has enough propellant to slow down and land properly. It'll be interesting to see if the company's engineers can successfully solve this issue.
However, many believe this solution is part of SpaceX's iterative process. They'll likely do this temporarily to better understand the landing process. Once they do, the hot stage ring won't be discarded, as that would not align with their plans for full reusability and rapid turnaround. In addition to the change involving the removal of the hot stage ring, the launch timeline for SpaceX's fourth flight also has some notable differences compared to the third launch. In fact, a detailed timeline of the entire Starship launch process for Flight 4 has been posted in our video from May 25th. If you want to learn more, click on the video link pinned in the comments. Now, here are some of the differences. One of the notable pre-launch changes involves the fueling process. During Flight 3, SpaceX began by loading the Starship upper stage with liquid oxygen first at T-53 minutes, followed by loading liquid methane on the ship two minutes later. Flight 4 flips that around and starts with liquid methane first at T-49 minutes and then liquid oxygen two minutes after that. Similarly, on the Super Heavy flight, Flight 3 started with liquid oxygen loading at T-42 minutes and then liquid methane a minute later. Flight 4 begins with liquid methane at T-40 minutes and then liquid oxygen 3 minutes after that. SpaceX did not state a reason for the reversals in the fueling process, but they've been doing quite a bit of work to modify the storage tanks for both the liquid oxygen and liquid methane in the tank farm near the pad. The vertical tanks were replaced with horizontal ones over the past several months as part of the work on the ground systems. All told, the timing for fueling Starship is set to be about 4 minutes shorter than the last flight. It's only about 11 minutes longer than it takes to fully fuel a Falcon 9 rocket. The launch timeline is also somewhat tweaked. While the end of the mission, pegged as an exciting landing, remains at roughly the same time in the ballpark of an hour and 5 minutes, Flight 4 streamlines much by removing some of the additional flight goals. Three key events were added to the timeline, though. One near liftoff and two towards the end of the mission. Besides the mission to jettison the hot stage adapter to reduce the flight mass that I mentioned earlier, the other two events added in the next attempt include the so-called landing flip at T plus 1 hour 5 minutes and 38 seconds, followed by the landing burn 5 seconds later. The launch date is not far off, although SpaceX has publicly stated the latest launch date is June 5th. That still depends on receiving approval from the FAA. The SpaceX-led mishap investigation following Flight 3 remains ongoing, but the company's hoping to utilize a pre-existing clearance mechanism within the FAA's rules to return to flight before the investigation fully wraps up. During Flight 3, neither vehicle's automated flight safety system was triggered, and no debris impacted outside of predefined hazard areas, SpaceX said. Pending the FAA's finding of no public safety impact, a license modification for the next flight could be issued without formal closure of the mishap investigation. When reached for comment, the FAA confirmed receiving SpaceX's request for a public safety determination. Should they agree, SpaceX could indeed fly while the mishap investigation progresses. The FAA is responsible for and committed to protecting the public during commercial space transportation launch and re-entry operations, the agency stated. On April 5th, SpaceX requested the FAA make a public safety determination as part of the ongoing Starship OFT-3 mishap investigation. The FAA is reviewing the request and will be guided by data and safety at every step. Frequent and consistent launches are crucial for SpaceX's development process and for NASA as well. The rockets contracted to support a crewed lunar landing during the Artemis 3 mission, currently scheduled for September 2026. A nearly year-long delay from its previous December 2025 target date is announced by NASA earlier this year. June is coming, and we're about to witness a historic moment as the first giant rocket is set to land successfully. Yes, I'm talking about SpaceX's Starship. Clearly, this event will be a milestone that propels SpaceX to new heights. But it goes beyond that. As NASA officials have declared, Starship Launch 4 is more important than you think. 212 days from Flight 1 to Flight 2, 117 days from Flight 2 to Flight 3, and only about 83 days from Flight 3 to 4 if the launch takes place as scheduled on June 5th. But even if Flight 4 hasn't happened yet or might be delayed by a couple days, we can see the time intervals are rapidly decreasing. This indeed further demonstrates SpaceX's relentless efforts and development in their project, as well as the noble mission to the moon entrusted by NASA. That's why there's nothing that can make NASA worried about SpaceX. They've even shown many times the importance and role of SpaceX's Starship for future missions beyond what we think. Recently, NASA's Administrator Bill Nelson spoke before a Senate Appropriations Committee hearing, saying, Artemis III, if you compare it to the Apollo program, is a combination of Apollo 9, 10, and 11 
which was the landing on the moon. If we were true space enthusiasts, surely no one would be unfamiliar with the Apollo missions. Among them, Apollo 9 tested rendezvous, docking, and pilot operation of the lunar module in Earth orbit. Apollo 10 tested the lunar landing and returned to the command module using the lunar module. And Apollo 11 tested the landing and return from the surface of the moon. It's like testing the movement, takeoff, landing, and flying a new airplane around the field and then putting it in service. Artemis 3 will include all those tasks. Given the new trajectory and complexity of the lunar mission, the prominence of the gigantic Starship spacecraft cannot be overlooked. Nelson emphasized, uh, And so it is a difficult task, and if we land, it is dependent on SpaceX having their lander ready. Now, they have hit all of their milestones, and in a couple of weeks, they're going to launch that huge rocket that has 33 Raptor engines in its tail, uh, and they're going to do uh, more uh, showing the space worthiness of it. It is uh, my hope that SpaceX will be ready with their lander. Artemis 3 is currently scheduled for September 2026, a timeline that is neither too distant nor too near. According to NASA, this is the most suitable time for SpaceX Starship to be fully prepared. We should not interpret this as NASA doubting SpaceX's capabilities or underestimating its ability to meet the earlier deadline. Let's think realistically. The extended time frame acts as a bonus for SpaceX. They will have the opportunity to conduct hundreds of tests and dozens of launches, build launch towers, and evaluate their entire production and launch operation systems. It would be fantastic if everything could be perfected. But as Nelson also mentioned, what SpaceX needs now are milestones. The most immediate milestone is the four Starship test flight, which SpaceX has planned for next week. Although they haven't received an FAA license for the launch yet, they announced on May 28th that Flight 3 did not cause any public safety incidents. This ensures that June 5th is still a viable launch date. The first day we get that license, we're going to fly, said SpaceX's Starbase General Manager Kathy Luters on May 14th. Currently, Starship is once again showing its magnificent stack configuration. It just completed its second wet dress rehearsal, incorporating the water deluge system test on May 28th. Some might wonder why SpaceX needed that second wet dress rehearsal. Well, this is perhaps an exam test when after the first wet dress rehearsal, Starship 29 was lifted off from Super Heavy 11 for inspection. Clearly, ensuring the spacecraft operates normally for the next launch is not an unnecessary measure. What are your thoughts? What else might SpaceX be testing? Comment down below and let us know. Okay, the four Starship flight needs to be meticulously checked with no room for errors during the launch. The primary goal of this launch is for both stages to return to Earth at designated locations. This is not only crucial for the Starship program, but also is a key factor that NASA depends on if they aim to send their astronauts to the moon by the end of this decade. If the fourth flight is successful, as expected, it'll be a significant boost for SpaceX and NASA, even solidifying America's leading position in the modern space race. Starship is humanity's best hope for cheap space access, estimated at $2 million bucks a launch, chiefly because both stages are reusable. Imagine affordable trips to the moon where even ordinary citizens could travel to other planets. This represents an expansion of opportunities for space exploration moving towards a future where humanity will dominate the universe. Therefore, initially, SpaceX planned to start the recovery stages with a Mechazilla arms equipped on the launch tower, a novel and undoubtedly challenging process. In reality, it might take some time to recover the Super Heavy booster successfully, and longer for the upper stage of the Starship, which endures particularly harsh conditions during re-entry. Conditions never before tested on this scale. However, this does not mean it takes that long. If the fourth flight lands successfully, they could catch Super Heavy on the very next flight. Here's why this is feasible, and why that task might be easier than it looks. First, they've done this before with Falcon 9. SpaceX has successfully landed Falcon 9 boosters multiple times. They have a strong foundation in vertical landing technology, having perfected the technique several launches before achieving consistent success. SpaceX had perfected Falcon 9 landings three or four rockets before the first success, except the landing legs kept collapsing or not locking properly, an issue that does not apply to Super Heavy, which uses a different mechanism. Second, size and stability. Larger objects are easier to control in these scenarios. Landing a Falcon 9 and landing a Super Heavy booster are similar tasks from a software point. However, as the size increases, the process gets slower and more manageable. Thus, landing the larger Super Heavy is easier compared to the smaller Falcon 9. 
Besides, Super Heavy can hover unlike Falcon 9, which relies on a suicide burn to land. This hover capability simplifies the landing process, as it allows for more controlled and precise maneuvers. Finally, people seem to think that the actual moment of the catch is going to be hard. Not so. The Royal Navy did catches of Harrier jump jets in heavy seas. There, both the airplane and the hook were moving in three dimensions. The whole process was under human control. Everything happens much faster with a 7 or 8 ton jump jet than with a 200 ton booster approaching a fixed set of chopsticks. Catching Starship will be slightly more complex than Super Heavy due to the dynamics involved. Starship performs a flip maneuver and has to hover just before landing. This maneuver requires it to move away from the tower, flip, and then moves towards the tower again to hover and land. This process exposes the tower to more exhaust and is more susceptible to wind gusts. However, even landing partial reuse Starship has enormous potential. For example, if used simply as a disposable vehicle, it could launch 250 to 300 tons into orbit, more than twice as much as its closest rival, the SLS. More than anything, SpaceX wants to place a propellant storage depot in low Earth orbit LEO to refuel outward starships. In order to carry the maximum load, approximately 200 tons, a version 2 starship will normally expend all its propellant to reach LEO and then refuel at the propellant depot, allowing it to send that payload far beyond Earth orbit. As Robert H. Heinlein once said, when you reach orbit, you're halfway to anywhere. The propellant depot used for this refueling process will likely resemble Starship, except with larger propellant tanks to increase its refueling capability. No doubt SpaceX plans to use this propellant depot in orbit, hence it won't need to survive re-entry or be caught by the Mechazilla to operate normally. After each refueling operation, SpaceX plans to replenish the propellant depot using tanker vehicles, a simplified version of Starship's payload section to decrease its dry mass. Hence, if Starship was partially or fully expended, each tanker flight could carry at least 250 tons of fuel to orbit. In real terms, that means it should take only four tanker flights to refuel a lunar Starship, which requires around 983 tons of propellant, or three tanker flights to refuel a Mars Starship, which requires about 660 tons of propellant due to an assist from atmospheric braking. Admittedly, these tanker vehicles would need to be disposed of after each flight, but considering their simplicity and relatively low cost, a Raptor engine is under a million dollars to produce, this should allow orbital refueling to occur fairly regularly as SpaceX aims to make up one starship per day. Once orbital refueling is available, this should allow NASA to commence moon landings with their Artemis program. They intend to use Starship as a human landing system to send astronauts and cargo to the lunar surface every two years. And not only can we go to the moon, but we can also explore other planets like Mars and even settle there as Elon Musk's ambition. That's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.